spots here. Uh, oops. Um, so you have these uh, what you, these uh, spots here, what we call spots, and you have a laser that will point at these spots and will measure the relative displacement of these and, and these these spots. And you can from this you can deduce uh, analytically uh, if there is a, a problem in the structure. Uh, so the that idea uh, it's it's not new. It has been. Uh, the what is called reflective targets uh, has been in research since the early 2000 and, uh, and it has been uh, proven that can be implemented in, in real world applications. So in real world applications, this is, is a, a zoom from uh, what can be done for if you have a, if you have a bridge and you, you want to get a quantitative data from this bridge, you can you can use this uh, this technology to measure the deflection. Now, the key issue is how to uh, convert the measurements that you make on on site into uh, quantitative uh, conclusion uh, for that. Now, uh, I don't want to, uh, I wanted to to put this slide here. Is that the the question of earlier Bernoulli beam is very important subject in, in, in engineering. We can find beams everywhere. Almost uh, you look, you will, you will see beams if you, if you are trained to, to look at it. So for example, when you are driving your car, see mainly the, the body of the car is an assembly of beams uh, uh, from all over the places. So you have um, your door here is maintained by basically more or less by, by beam. The, 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 the chassis, the, 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 the crash, uh, crash um, apparatus that is, uh, that is placed in front of the car, all of these are designed in practice as beams. Uh, when you take the plane, you are sitting on a floor that is maintained by composite beams nowadays. Mm -hmm. So what I, what I call beam, basically, um, when we teach students, a beam is basically a 3D solid that has one dimension, um, uh, one dimension dominant other than two. So when in this, in this configuration, you look at the beam here, uh, the length, the length of the beam is the dominant dimension and the transverse the other two dimensions are negligible compared to the, to the third. That's what we call beam. Okay, uh, this is an example where the idea of my project came from. So uh, a wind tower company wants to develop a technique that allows them uh, from measurements, we place some measurements uh, on the, um, on, on these structures and we want, uh, uh, we want to detect if there is a problem uh, and react according to that. So that's where the, the idea or the initiative came from. Okay, so I'll talk uh, now, uh, go back to details. Uh, we'll uh, take a look at the optimal layout of sensor on um, for identification of downfield earlier Bernoulli beams. And then the second problem is the stress recovery from displacement obtained by image processing. Okay, uh, the direct problem for if you have a beam and the direct problem can be formulated by uh, Lagrange equations. And you have here the, the acceleration. So here you have the inertia, the inertia effect. You have here the two major uh, components. You have the inertia effect and you have the mechanics uh, effect or the mechanics deformation that appears in the second term. This term here is uh, relative to the rotation, but it is very negligible. So in practice, this term we will eliminate. What you have on the right side here is the loading. So what you put on the beam. So if it's, uh, if it's uh, in the lab, we can definitely uh, define what is it. If, in, if it's uh, in, the, in the site, uh, we can um, definitely control 
the right the right side here. So as you can see, the dynamic uh, the dynamic equation you have the of course the effect of time and the effect of the um, coordinate x, which is uh, from from a reference x that we will define. Now um, I don't want to bother you with the engineering details. These are the parameters that control the um, uh, control the behavior of a beam. So in order to treat this equation um, in a standard way, we will normalize the, this equation by using this normalization just to simplify everything and uh, convert the uh, abscissa x from zero to one and uh, normalize the time with the fundamental frequency of the beam that is given here. Uh, there is no need to, 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 to get into depth with this. It's a technicality uh, that on the elementary level dynamics. Now, if I simplify like after normalization, that the equation will be reduced to three terms here. And these three terms, the, uh, the, what is important is that, that X now varies between zero and one. And uh, time is a normalized time so we can treat this equation. So in practice, if we um, look at the practical numbers, epsilon B, the term here is very negligible. So this, uh, this term in the middle uh, will be eliminated. So the, bo the boundary and the initial condition for, for the problem usually it depends on the application. Usually you want the displacement at the origin is fixed, meaning that the, your beam doesn't move at, at both ends of the beam. So you have a, uh, W at uh, X at time zero is equal zero. And you have um, at any time the, the deflection will start in uh, left and right at any time is equal zero. And uh, then you have some conditions on the velocity. We can usually in practice, we, we consider that the beam doesn't move at the beginning of the loading. Now, the solution of this direct problem is uh, straightforward. It's available in most textbooks in dynamics. So we basically in practice, we decompose W uh, in a form of spectral uh, components. Uh, one component that depends on time, the, uh, the, uh, the other component that depends on X. So it's basically spectral decomposition. Uh, and uh, without going into details, we can prove that the spectral decomposition is give, give us reasonable results in, 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 in practical, and uh, the, uh, anal the, 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 um, the nice thing is that the problem is relatively very simple and we can solve it analytically um, uh, over time. So we have uh, almost every, all, all the tools to be able to solve this, uh, this equation in, in terms of uh, the space and time. Now, if you look at uh, what I am interested in this project is, uh, uh, so you have a beam, and uh, here uh, that is uh, fixed in one or both ends, so it doesn't uh, doesn't move, it doesn't rotate. So usually the 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 the, uh, the loading that I was referring to is the load Q. It is a certain function that can be very constant or can 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 have any any shape or form. Or it can even be a direct, uh, direct, uh, direct uh, uh, mass in the in the in the in the beam. So the idea is um, to be able to if the, if this beam has some damage somewhere, I want to know uh, where to place my sensors to be able uh, to detect that uh, that damage. So the idea is that if a beam is damaged, then the uh, the displacement that you obtain is um, a superposition of uh, two terms. The first term, what I call WL, which is the linear displacement. That is the displacement that is expected from a linear system, like that is solved by, by what I showed you by the classical solution. And uh, a second term that I will call WD, that is uh, uh, due to the damage accumulation. So if you have a beam, 
that is um, damaged, you expect that the, the displacement, overall displacement that you measure is, uh, is larger than uh, what is supposed to be for an elastic behavior. So oh, that extra term is our interest and we want to quantify this term here uh, in, in practice. So, uh, so for that, what, uh, what I am interested is the observable variable that I can measure in practice and the observ observable variable is the, what we call in the jargon civil engineering, is the, the strain. And basically the, the strain is the second derivative, the second derivative of the, of the deflection or the second derivative of the normalized deflection. Now the strain variable here is a function of X, function of T and function of N, which is the number of Hagen modes that I'm using in my analytical model. So uh, what I'm trying to convey here is that um, each, each one of these terms can be approximated by, um, by an analytical expression as, it, uh, as expected. So both terms L and D can be approximated either this way or that way. So this uh, equation here is for static load when the load doesn't depend on time. And this is when the load depends on time. To be honest with you, what is, um, what is uh, interesting is uh, to deal with the dynamic uh, part because the, the static part is relatively uh, simple, but very revealing. But in my presentation, I will focus uh, on the static part uh, because I will not be able to cover the, the dynamic part because that is, um, I think it's, it's worth by itself a presentation. So what, uh, how I will formulate the problem is I will define that the, the strain that is due to, da to damage, I will expect it to be dependent on in a certain uh, function of the, uh, what I call PD, which is amount of uh, load that is due to, to damage and the position of the sensor. So the position of the sensor here is defined by xd. So I have uh, basically uh, an expression, um, approximated expression between, uh, that gives me an estimation of the strain, um, of the strain that is, that is excessive strain that is due to damage. So um, I will assume that I have, um, R sensors, R1, R2, or uh, one, two, three, up to R, and they have measurements of the of the of this variable here using uh, conventional technology like these strain gauges. So this is, is a simple electrical uh, circuit, uh, very cheap that you can you can place on the structure and allow you to measure this term here. And then I would define a gap function. So the gap function, what is it? If I explain it, uh, so this is, is the measurements. This is, is the linear term that I, um, uh, that I deduced from my model. And this is, is the expected damage term. So basically this equation here, tell, uh, I want to minimize this uh, gap function in such a way that uh, gives me uh, a good estimation of, of the, the strain that is due to the, to the damage. Now, uh, I will skip the details how to formulate the, to minimize the scap function. So basically, I will simplify the, um, the modeling by introducing a new variable yk that, uh, that is a function, nonlinear function of the load uh, uh, PD and uh, the position of the strain gauges, and we can express that uh, analytically this way. So basically, this term here that I explained there can be uh, can be written as a combination of a function that depend on x and uh, this vector here y k that that also depend on the load and and x. So the, uh, the gap function can be written as a nonlinear equation uh, between uh, yk that depends on the position of the sensors and gamma k, 
and the, the error here between the measurements and the estimation from the uh, linear, linear system. So basically that this equation psi r is the uh, um, is the measurements of the difference between what we measure and what we what we calculate. So basically the problem that we and we end up is to uh, we end up to solve a nonlinear problem uh, to find what is the best x x1 x2 xl and what is p1 p2 uh, pl that allows me to to detect uh, to calculate uh, the damage. So uh, this uh, in the concept of um, design of experiment theory, uh, this is, is called the information matrix of the design. So one, uh, one possibility, there is no, not a unique solution for this problem. And one possibility is to use the concept of the optimality criterion. And the optimality criterion tells us that the op optimum uh, information, if you want to extract as much information from the system, we, we try to, uh, to maximize the determinant of this, uh, uh, of this information matrix. So uh, if we have an expression for, for this matrix and we, we are able to calculate the determinant, the position of the sensors in the end are equal uh, are the one that allows us to maximize the determinant of this matrix. So this, this result is not new, it's relatively uh, old. It's very well uh, uh, exploited in, my, in many area uh, like um, machine learning nowadays when, when statistics uh, kicks in. Now, uh, let's see in practice how, how it is. So here we are, uh, we do have um, uh, an academic example. So we have the, the length of the beam is one meter, the, uh, the, the depth of the beam is three millimeters. We have the, um, we have the density of, we have the, uh, the uh, young modulus. And then here we have a, a position of uh, the applied load. So at 50 centimeters, is, so in the middle and the length of the load is 10 centimeters. So it's a small portion of the, of the beam and the level of the load is, uh, is two kilopascal. Now to compare our algorithm with the, uh, the real, um, with the numerical solution. So we uh, purposefully, we applied, uh, we simulated the damage by an excess of uh, load that is at position 80 centimeters, that is, has five centimeters length and uh, uh, an applied load of 20, uh, 20 pascals. So it's a small load that we can apply on the structure to, to model. So we are able to, as I said, we are able to calculate the true, um, the true behavior of the, of the beam based on this data. Now, what we want to, to detect, we want to detect where to place our sensors um, to be able to, to, uh, to, obtain, uh, to obtain these data. So, um, so my variable in, in, in this numerical experiment is the number of sensors that we will be using. So in the first example here, the number of sensors is two. So if I, I assume that I'm using two sensors uh, that will measure where I need to place my sensors. So um, this graph here shows you the uh, determinant determinant of the uh, information matrix as a function of, uh, uh, of the position of the sensors x1, x2. So we want, as you can see, the, um, the maximum, of, uh, maximum of, this, uh, of this function is not, is not obvious. Um, it's not a convex, uh, convex function. It's not simple to obtain. So uh, we use it. Uh, basically uh, uh, maple to, uh, to detect where, where is the maximum. So one way to show that the, this criteria function is to take slices of this, uh, this function. So at different positions of, uh, so I, if I put, for example, x1 equal one, I have a slice, a slice of this, uh, this function here. And this slice is, is shown 
uh, with this line here. So you can see this, what you can see is this uh, criteria function. So it, it decreases, um, it decreases, then it has a, a, sh a funny shape, but the maximum is when x1, uh, x2 is equal to zero. So, uh, so this, uh, this orange line here and this blue line here, they basically, they are symmetric and they are telling me that if I want to, if I have only uh, to use two sensors, they have to be placed at the ends of the beam. And from engineering point of view, it's very clear that these are the points where uh, the stress is maximum. And we know that it makes very, very sense. So we basically, when L is equal to two, we don't need common engineering sense is, is, um, um, is verified here with this example. And then, uh, um, uh, this, uh, um, I think this is the function that uh, allows me to, to detect where the, uh, the, the, the value of the, uh, of the, the load that is, that, that is, that is to, to be applied. Now, if you move, if I have three sensors, uh, then the, uh, the gap function uh, or the determinant of the gap function is the, the information matrix has this shape. And uh, here we can see that uh, the, the maximum is either in the ends or in the middle. So we have to place our, our sensors in the end or in the middle of, of the beam. The last example is when L is equal four. So when L is equal four, we see that the maximum is at position 058 and 042. Uh, so that gives me the, gives us the, where to place the sensors uh, in practice. Now, uh, as a summary, so if you have two sensors, you have to, do, to be placed at the ends of the beam. If you have three sensors, one in the middle, uh, one at the end. If you have four, they have to be placed at these positions here. And this table here shows you what is, um, what is the valuation of, of the damage, where the damage is located. So here it's in centimeters. So the damage is located at 75 centimeters, but in theory, it should be at 80. So we have a 5% error. If you increase actually here should be four, L equal three, uh, the position is 81. So there is an error of 137%. If L is equal four here is almost we obtain a good result. So for this uh, numerical example, we are showing that uh, it is possible. This, this approach is possible. It will allow us to detect not only the, the position, uh, the position where the damage is, but also the amplitude of the damage because the, the amplitude of the damage is one and we can, uh, we can, we can uh, arrive to a relative error of, of 4%. Um, so it's an indicator that this, uh, this, this methodology is, it, it is possible to, to be applied in practice and uh, one way to apply this technology is to use, uh, uh, to use these sensors. These are wireless sensors, so they don't need to be powered. So the power, the power is, uh, is integrated into the, into the sensor itself. And we can place these on the wind uh, turbines here, uh, shafts, and uh, uh, we, we can place them in the optimum positions uh, and then we collect the data, and from this data we can deduce if, if something is uh, is is going uh, is going on. Obviously, if you have only one uh, one structure, uh, you can put as many sensors as you want because, uh, from budget point of view, uh, it, that is possible. But if you have thousands of these structures and you want to monitor them, it is I think it's. Uh, it's a good idea to, to, to minimize the number of sensors, but at the same time, you have to make sure that uh, the, the outcome or the results are valuable from engineering standpoint. So that's where the minimization of the, of the sensor and the optimization of their placement 
is, is of importance to, to the owners of this uh, wind farm. Uh, as I said before, I think the, uh, the, the extension of this, of this approach uh, for, for uh, dynamic uh, loading, and you can understand very easily that when you have a, when you have a wind power, this is submitted to very, um, very important uh, dynamic, wind, dynamic load due, due to, to wind. And uh, these uh, shafts here are solicited. So there is a lot of load that is acting on these shafts. And you, it will be very important to detect not only to optimize not only where to place these sensors, but also when uh, when the uh, the damage, like in terms of time, the optimum time to uh, or to, to expect or to measure uh, that there is a possible uh, possible damage to the to the structure. Now, uh, so what I said is that the uh, the dynamic load is important, but in civil engineering, most of the time that is very difficult. To, to run. So you imagine if you have a bridge and you want to load it under, under dynamic load, it's very, very difficult. However, a static load is relatively simple. So uh, in practice, this is what, uh, what is done. So once we've, uh, we design a bridge, we calculate, we do everything uh, before delivering the, the infrastructure to the public, uh, we load the structure to the maximum possible loading. So this, this is an example of uh, loading that, uh, uh, that, that uh, we do in practice. So you assume that if you have a, a loading like this, you, you, you are able to measure the deflection of the elements that are supporting the, uh, the, the bridge. So the technology that I want to share with you is what is called digital image processing or digital image correlation in this example. So here you have a specimen that is loaded. And this specimen here is uh, like there are images that are taken by these two cameras. And these two cameras here will allow me to uh, observe what is going on in the specimen by image by processing uh, the deflection. So uh, that's the principle. Uh, of course, we cannot put uh, a bridge in, uh, in the structure lab and test it. We can test uh, material, but we can test small elements, but we will never be able. You can see the, the, the argument I don't need to emphasize on. So in practice, what we do, this is a project that uh, I ran a few years ago. So we have a beam that we will load under, under controlled loading and we will paint the beam by a certain paint. The idea here is to include a random pattern along the beam. And then I will take images of this beam under the deflection. And uh, by processing these uh, images, I am able to detect where is the uh, deflection. So I am able to measure the, uh, the, the actual response of the structure. And you can see for this example in this beam, you have some damages here, you have some cracks. So obviously these cracks here will, will, will not be directly observable. So we'll assume I didn't see them, but I want to recover them. I want to observe them or, or detect them even if they are very small, I detect them from the measurements of the, def the, def the deflection. So um, I will not go into details. We are able to, so for, the, for a beam like this, with this uh, type of paint, we are able to do a comparison between, um, so two measurements that, uh, the, uh, what we call LDDTs, these are mechanical, uh, equipment that we can place under the beam. And these are very old technology that, um, that is, we'll use it as a standard to, to calibrate our uh, numerical technique to calculate the, the, the displacements. So you can see that uh, the curve here that is in bluish, uh, it's, we were able to, to calculate the, the, or to detect the deflection of the beam 
relatively very closely with uh, comparative to uh, old fashion or old, old, old techniques. So the advantage of using images is that you don't you don't need to have a support, you don't need to to, to have a, a power supply. So basically you bring the camera, you measure, you measure the, the beam and the deformation, and you are able, we can, we we were able to prove that uh, that we are able to uh, to obtain uh, valuable results. Uh, so this graph here shows uh, the form of the deflection that I'm talking about. So this is along the beam. So it's a beam of two meter long, and we are able to measure the deflection at different loads of uh, different levels of, of loads. So we apply a load of uh, 36. We obtain this curve. We increase the load. We apply a load of 47. You obtain this curve, etc. So you can see experimentally that, uh, that uh, the more you apply a load, obviously the damage will increase and uh, you can have a, a more deflection that will happen. Now what you have here in these spots, these are the uh, measurements that we obtained by the, uh, the old technology, which is the LVDGs that we place under the bed. So what I'm trying to convey here is that the technology of measuring the deflection using uh, optical techniques um, is reliable, uh, based on you have to pay a lot of attention. I have to confess that uh, these results are obtained in uh, laboratory conditions. So, so obviously these are ideal conditions and we don't expect them to be uh, true for, um, for um, real world applications where you have to, to pay attention to a lot of things. Now, what I want to do uh, after this is uh, the idea uh, that I want to pursue is that uh, from these curves here, this is, this is the, the solution of the, uh, the differential equations uh, governing the deflection of a beam. So I, I want from these data here, I want to detect what is the internal properties or the internal characteristics of the beam that will uh, that are in uh, correlation with this data. So basically, we 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 are uh, interested to formulate the problem in a form of inver uh, of inverse problem. So the direct problem for a beam and the static, as uh, this is, is the third term that I explained it earlier in, in previously, and so it's a differential equation of order four, and uh, the term here e i of x, which is without going into details from engineering, this is what represents if the beam is um, is sound or damaged. So if e i here is a function that depends on x decline over uh, by the damage, then we arrive at a certain time where the deflection here will become excessive and the use of the infrastructure uh, um, become uh, almost uh, impossible to. So we have to intervene when the damage here reaches a certain, a certain level. So the solution of this problem is it's a classical, it's available in, uh, in undergrad, uh, textbooks of uh, structure mechanics. Uh, so you have here the, in this example, we took uh, a simple uh, a simple beam. We place it uh, perfectly a black background and we took images of this beam under loading. And what we want to, do, to, to calculate is the position of the uh, defects of in this beam based on the defects. So technically, if I want, Want to calculate calculate this uh, this term here EI of x? I can do some algebraic uh, algebraic uh, combination and my manipulation, and I can obtain that my function EI of x. I will need to calculate the second derivative of the deflection that I measured earlier. But if you look at the data of the of the of the displacement here, there is you can see that obviously you have a lot of noise in the data. So if you imagine, if you want to calculate the second derivative of this deflection here, your, 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 it will not be possible to, to solve this inverse problem uh, directly by simply by using this trivial, uh, the trivial solution. If, if, if I take a look at uh, 
at this particular example. So we have a, a shaft here that is under loading. And you can see that the, uh, even if we do some filtering, we still have a lot of noise that so uh, the direct uh, calculation of what we call in the jargon of civil engineering, this is, is the, uh, the rotation. So the rotation here is the curvature here is almost impossible to calculate numerically uh, without um, direct. So uh, I'll show you how to how we did proceed. So what we did, we use it uh, a method that uh, called modification. So what is a modification is a convolution that we will apply smoothing. So we will smooth. Uh, the uh, function f of y, uh, we will smooth it by a Gaussian kernel uh, within a certain a certain uh, space. So if, if the space is controlled by the variable delta and p, p usually we detect, uh, we use uh, three for, for the uh, modeling the, uh, the Gaussian kernel. So this technique here of modification, the idea here is to be able to manipulate the, the, the deflection with the noise. So basically it's a filtering, uh, it's a filtering technique that will allow me to manipulate, uh, manipulate uh, the, the deflection um, instead of working directly on the deflection, I will work on its uh, transfor uh, transformed uh, uh, form so uh, j data of f of x, which is the modified what we call the modified deflection. So uh, the math, the mathematics of this technique is available. Uh, it has been there for a while, and we can show that this technique is uh, consistent, stable, etc. And we can prove that we can calculate the derivative, approximate the derivative of of uh, noisy function relatively well. So the bottom line of this technique is I will be able to, to calculate the derivative of the deflection uh, by, uh, by smoothing or by eliminating the effect of the noise. So once I have this deflection here, this, uh, sorry, uh, this rotation here, what I call in the jargon of structural engineering, once I have data, I will be able to formulate my problem uh, the direct problem in terms of uh, uh, of uh, finite element modeling. So what I will do, I will uh, uh, make an assumption that EI of X will be a function, B, uh, one minus D of X multiplied by a unit of reference that I will use EI of zero. So the value, uh, what I am interested to calculate is this value of D of X, which, uh, which I call damage. So you can see that if damage is equal to zero, then your structure is sound, is as if it was built, built today. But if the damage reaches or close to one, uh, you have a problem and you, you need to intervene. But in practice, if damage reaches 0 0.2, 0 0.3, um, by, uh, by that time, it's already uh, problematic. So the, the evaluation of this term here it's, it's, it's important. So in the um, methodology of uh, finite element, the euler bernoulli beam. So if you formulate it as uh, for uh, on the element level, we can show that we can write the, uh, the matrix in the matrix format, the weak form of equilibrium, one minus D, the, uh, the standard stiffness multiplied by these um, projections of this displacement field on the, nodal coordinate. And so these vectors here, these are available from the data. I was able to obtain these data uh, uh, by modification. And these two terms here are obtained directly from measurements from the image processing. And uh, these data, I will assume they are available. So I will assume meaning that I know the, uh, the load, meaning if, uh, if you refer to my image, uh, the, uh, the photo that I showed you, I know how many, um, how many tracks are on the beam. So obviously then my problem here can be converted into a linear system. So K of data where data is the row of damages for each element. So D1, D2, D3, Dn. So uh, I know an expression of my equilibrium in the weak form and I can now proceed with evaluating what is this vector data 
that, that is of interest to me. Now, the, the problem, uh, I will formulate it as a data discrepancy problem. So basically, I have a, a functional that depends on the displacement, depends on the internal variables, the damage D1, D, D, D1, D2, Dn. And then I have a, a, a linear system, or we have the, the finite element model that depends on data. I have the measurements here, and I want to minimize, oh, there is a, a square that is missing here. Sorry for that. So uh, I will take the, um, the, uh, the error. Uh, then I will, um, I, will, I will add it, I will add it uh, a regularization term that in, in, our, in our task here, we use it, uh, the total variational uh, formulation without going to details. The solution here is relatively classical. The constraint of this problem is that the equilibrium of the, of the beam has to be established, meaning that K of data for the measurement U should be equal to the equilibration mm -hmm. equilibrated uh, force. Uh, the solution of this uh, minimization, augmented minimization regularized problem is solved by the, the gradient of this cost function is calculated by an adjoint uh, method. Uh, if there is an interest, we, we already published this work uh, a while ago. Okay, so now, now let's look at uh, the results. So the first result here, you have a beam that is not damaged. So we want to, to technically, we want to recover. So if you measure, uh, you load the beam without being damaged. So technically I should obtain one everywhere. But uh, the algorithm or the approach that we are using uh, gives me one almost everywhere, but except at the ends. And uh, there is a physical explanation why we are not able to reach that point around here, because the data that is available at the ends, it's, it's uh, like the level of noise is, uh, did we use noise? No, we didn't use noise. So here, the level of information is, is meanless to, to the formulation because you get almost a displacement that is zero all the time in this corner here. Now, here is another numerical example where we purposefully, we design it to be to have a, a EI of X that is a parabola. So it is something that increased from, I see 0 0.3 to 1.5 something and go back to parabola and uh, uh, with the deflection uh, put aside the ends here, we were able to cover. So from engineering uh, um, point of view, what happens at the, at the, um, the, uh, the, the, the resting points of the, of the beam is not really very interesting. What is the majority of the problems happen somewhere here. So, and we are able to show, that uh, the, the, uh, the, um, the approach that we, we used is capable of detecting, uh, recollecting or, or uh, calculating the stiffness. Now, the third the numerical example is that we designed it to beam or we basically numerically, we have a beam that has two defects at position, uh, roughly 2.5 meter and six meters. So here we included two defects and we run a finite element model and we, uh, we induce noise. So when we induce noise, so in A, there is no noise. So we were able to locate where is the, where is the damage, most probable uh, damage in, in the structure. Now we added 5% noise in the data and still the 5% uh, noise is something that from engineering point of view, it's relatively um, very normal level of noise that we can, we can get. And we are able to detect uh, the position of the, these uh, defects. Now, if we increase the noise uh, 10%, um, we started having uh, problems here, but nevertheless, uh, we can clearly see we didn't uh, manipulate uh, the, the outcome. We didn't run an FFT or anything to make sure that, that to smooth this equation, uh, these uh, results. 
So we were able, uh, nevertheless, up to 10% noise, which is from practical uh, point of view is an acceptable level of uh, accuracy. Now, this is from numerical uh, point of view, uh, numerical approach. So we know the outcome. So we know what is what should be the outcome when we compare the, the behavior of the approach. Now, in practice, we took this, uh, this beam in the lab. We applied to load, and then we tested different, uh, different defects. So the first example, we, uh, we did the, included a defect somewhere in the middle of the beam. So basically, we come physically, and we uh, cut the beam uh, relatively uh, in the middle. And we collected the, the displacement. We ran the, the approach, we did the modification, we formulated the problem, et cetera, we solved it. And we did, uh, we were able to prove that uh, uh, significantly we can detect the location of a crack here exactly from the, uh, the digital image uh, processing. Uh, this result here shows what happened if I have uh, three cracks with different magnitude. So I have, I included a crack here, I included physically a crack here, and I included a crack in the middle. So I, we took this beam, we added two small cracks, and we can see that not only the position, but also the level of the damage is uh, co collected um, relatively with, with good accuracy. Uh, the third experimental example, we wanted to see if, um, if we have an extensive area of the beam that is cracked. So what we did here, we came to this, uh, uh, so this is the cross section of the tube. And we came here, we cut the, the bottom part. So we have basically very damaged uh, beam. And we collected the data, we collected the deflection, we ran our thing, and then we, we were able to detect that the, the damage is basically uh, well, uh, well defined from, from the data. Now, the last example that I want to discuss is when you combine distributed, distributed damage with concentrated damage with, uh, with cracks. So if you have something, this represents, uh, simulates results like uh, if, you have a, 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 if you have a corrosion, for example, in an extensive area, then you have a physical crack in the beam, and uh, you can see that with, uh, with these results, you can detect the crack. Here, you can detect the, um, uh, the, um, the, extensive, the, uh, the extensive damage in, in, in the beam. So overall, even though it is, it is a, a research project, what I do have uh, in mind is uh, what we did have in mind is that to uh, take this and apply to real world applications for uh, con basically concrete beams that are, are uh, that we can observe from uh, from visiting the the, the bridges that uh, these beams are corroded or are they have problems and we want to have an estimation how much these damage uh, are and that is maybe uh, the subject for another presentation later on if there is an interest. So uh, this is what all what I have to, to say today. And I will be open for your questions if there are any. I want to caution you that mm, maybe the, this is a presentation in applied math, but so uh, uh, I, I'm sure I, I showed you techniques that uh, to allows us to, to come out with the uh, with uh, practical results, but uh, for sure, from mathematical standpoint, there is a lot to say about uh, these techniques. If there are ways to improve them, if there are ways to control how uh, how these these techniques works. So, thank you very much for your attention, and I will be open to answer your questions. Thank you, Fauzi. Thank you uh, for this talk. Uh, and I think it's really an available talk in applied, uh, <laughs> it's applied mathematics and invest problems. <laughs> and no, what I mean, I think. Even techniques for to solve uh, invest problems. And you know that it's not easy to, 
to, to solve numerically these uh, problems. <laughs> Yeah, it is. It is. It is true. Uh, when uh, uh, when you look when you look at this, maybe uh, if you don't know what is going on here, uh, you underestimate the uh, the amount of uh, of details that that are needed to to really extract. Uh, you know, uh, in in engineering, whatever. Whatever, whatever you do, if you present a theory that is based only on uh, on a computer simulation, your paper will be rejected automatically. So you <laughs> all the time you have to confront your uh, your ideas with real uh, real experiment. Like you have to go in the lab and do something uh, to be able to. So if I use it only the the first example where, where I introduce it uh, artificial uh, noise in my numerical solution that, yeah, that it comforts us that, that yes, it's, it's possible. But if you don't have real, real data, nobody will believe you. And that's that's how, how it works uh, in, in, in the world of publications. Okay.